Bear down, Chicago Bears. I hope you're having a great morning. So uh, there's some controversy right now. Jalen Johnson is taking number one uh, and getting rid of the number 33. And I believe it's probably to honor Justin Fields. Uh, not sure, but uh, he hasn't made a statement so far. Just a, a move for number one. And a Twitter sleuth figured out that the most likely scenario right now for Caleb Williams is the number 18 jersey. So that settles the debate on whether or not Keenan Allen will be giving up number 13 or not. The answer is he will not. So um, that's where we are. That's what's going on so far. Uh, we're also going to grade Ryan Poles, and we're going to look at the Bears' 2024 schedule and see if there's anything that fits in. Uh, we got Bear down uh, from Crimson, and we got Jose says, seriously, though, who gives a shit what number he is? Bear's going to do Bear things and ruin him, too. Um, and the question was, is this news? Uh, no, it's not news. This is called thumbnail. Um, this is a this is something to – this is clickbait. This is to to get you to click and – Pay attention and you know try to figure it out. And if you like the content, you stay around. If you don't like the content, then you you know go cry about it somewhere or something. I don't know. I mean, you do what you do. Uh, so, I mean, we'll see what happens. But uh, and to be fair, there are people who are interested in this kind of stuff. So if you like this type of content, make sure that you hit the like button, the subscribe button, and the bell to be notified. And let's kick it off with the first one now. So what we've got is that. Uh, Jalen Johnson is switching to number one, uh, and it was revealed on Wednesday that Chicago Bears' Jalen Johnson is now wearing number one, last worn by Justin Fields. Um, there should be a sense of relief that Williams is not taking number one, given how toxic and polarizing the debate between Fields and Williams has been. Uh, the USC quarterback taking the number of his predecessor with a gasoline on a fire that the Bears uh, that is the Bears fans on social media would have a field day with. Uh, however, uh, it is also important to note that when he were, <laughs> was, but were in college, Jalen Johnson was wearing number one in college. So uh, he's basically just taking back his own jersey. So uh, there you have it. Uh, it. It's really just him doing his own thing. Uh, so he's a five, he's, he's got a four year, a uh, new four year contract. I mean, you know, the numbers available, do whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, now, moving on to the important one, I think uh, the Bears team store may have accidentally revealed Caleb Williams jersey number. So this is what happened. So in about two weeks, uh, the Bears jersey is going to immediately become one of the NFL's best sellers. And while that in itself is not uncommon, first overall picks are usually pretty popular. If you follow Chicago media closely enough, you'll remember that there are already a few blue and orange Caleb Williams jerseys out there, and they were all number 13. And yeah, they only exist for the entertainment of the radio host who pulled off the kind of cringy stunt, but it worked, and that's sports radio. But according to a recent Twitter detective, Williams' number 13 Bears jersey may never actually be a thing. Caleb Williams looks likely, according to this right here, uh, Caleb Williams looks likely to wear number 18. When trying to enter 18 customized on the Bears shop it errors. However... However, choosing a different name for 18 doesn't result in an error. Furthermore, you can enter Williams for any other number, but not number 18, which means that most likely Williams, that means is that he's going to be wearing number 18. So uh, what that's doing is it's avoiding the ability for uh, the, the NFL to customize jerseys, or, or at least for the Bears to customize the jerseys, thus leading to uh, this situation. So I think that's what's probably happening. So, uh, you know, we'll see whether or not that's a, a, a big deal or not. But uh, fans, uh, you're going to get your Jalen Johnson number one jerseys and your Caleb Williams number 18 jerseys soon enough. So that's an interesting move uh, by both of them. And it really kind of settles the debate. No more Robert Tanyan for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Jalen Johnson, I don't know that he's going to be honoring Justin Fields, if you will. Uh, I don't think there's really any reason for that. I think that most likely he just wanted his old Jersey number back. So we gave it to him on the screen. Uh, and now, uh, let's move on to, uh, the other piece here. And 
Uh, Bears Digest Sports Illustrated is grading Ryan Poles month of the Chicago Bears free agency. So uh, there's more involved in free agency than signing players who enter the unrestricted market. It's a matter of managing expenditures. Uh, and what we've done in free agency allows us to be flexible in the draft to really be able to take the best player, the one we feel fits for us in that spot. Did he really do this? And here's how it grades out. So there could be a few minor additions. Last year, they actually added Yannick Ngakwe in training camp after it became apparent their idea about interior pass rush taking pressure off the edge wouldn't fly. By the way, I've got some statistics for people who don't like Demarcus Walker. And guess what? Demarcus Walker's numbers actually looked pretty good towards the end of the season. So it might be that the Bears have settled that you know, this 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 lineup that they have, and with Demarcus Walker actually improving in his pass rush, according to statistics, they're going to just ride with him, and they might expect him to produce about six or seven sacks. So um, the year before, they had to bring in tackle and guard support at the start of camp because of the inexperience of the line. So more players could be added, but they'd be at a low rate with only $10.7 million left under the cap. So... Um, uh, in retaining the Bears free agents, they retained Jalen Johnson, uh, which had to be done at all costs, considering his status among the game's best cornerbacks, if not the best. There was no way they were losing him after applying the franchise tag. But to come up with the cash very quickly at $76 million over four years showed the total faith they had in him. It's also a case where Johnson was entirely reasonable and didn't try to hold up the bank, so to speak. The rate was fair because he had drawbacks like lack of interceptions until last year and plenty of missed games due to injuries. Still, he is high quality and Pulse signed him for... Uh, for the cash, even though he wasn't a player drafted by this regime, and even with two or three other young cornerbacks who could have similar skill levels in the future. And we're talking about Terrell Smith, and we're talking about Kyler Gordon. These guys were fantastic options for the Bears. And in fact, graded out almost as well as Jalen Johnson as the season wore on, and they had a lot of playing time. So, you know, a very capable secondary that we have right now. They showed the same decisiveness late season by locking up Cairo Santos, Co-commit and on Andrew Billings with deals uh, before they could hit this year's free agency market. Retaining long snapper Patrick Scales was another move they made. The departure of Darnell Mooney was unavoidable once Atlanta wanted to give him $39 million for three years. That's a high price for a player who's coming off two straight years of career lows in catches. The one negative for Poles in signing or letting his own free agents leave was Justin Jones. It's not that Jones was an exceptional player, and he probably maxed out by getting a three-year $30 million deal, but the alternative is using two second-year defensive tackles who haven't proven a thing yet, Zach Pickens and Gervon Dexter. Uh, former Bears, uh, Eddie Jackson, Yannick Ngakwe, Cody Whitehair, Lucas Patrick, Robert Tanyan, Rasheem Green, Mercedes Lewis, Equinemia St. Brown, Trent Taylor, and Dylan Cole are all currently free agents who weren't retained or were cut by the Bears. And apparently the right decisions were made as these players all remained unsigned one month after free agency. Can you can just consider that for a second? Eddie Jackson, Yannick Ngakwe, Cody Whitehair, Lucas Patrick, Robert Tanyan, Rasheem Green, Mercedes Lewis, Equinemia St. Brown, Trent Taylor, and Dylan Cole are all free agents and a month into free agency have still not signed with a team. That is a big, uh, <laughs> that's a, uh, whew, that is wild. That That is wild to consider that we had people on this roster that nobody wants to sign, not for the amount of money that they want. Uh, obviously, you know, at this point, it feels like maybe some of these guys were overpriced even at that level. So, uh, unrestricted free agents in the marketplace, they give them a C grade. Uh, the big unrestricted free agency signing here uh, was DeAndre Swift, who wasn't really among the elite running backs available at $24 million over three years. He's versatile and talented, but not Saquon Barkley. The lower cost did let the Bears remain eligible for bigger things at receiver and other positions. Polls generally approach the unrestricted free agency marketplace as a way to bring in low-cost free agents on one-year contracts. Uh, and by the way, that, we, that was extensive in what they did here. Um, uh, this was a bit surprising considering the money they had available after signing relatively inexpensive starting safety Kevin Byard uh, and number two tight end Gerald Everett as replacements for players no longer on the team. He signed Jonathan Owens for two years and $4.7 million. Uh, backup Amin Ogben Amigma. Uh, for 2.1, edge Jake Martin uh, for 1.2, uh, tackle Matty Pryor for 1.17, Dante Pettis for 1.5, and tackle Jake Curran 
for $1 million, all for one year. Center Coleman Shelton was yet another bargain at one year and $3 million, but could be the starter. Numerous other expensive uh, uh, center choices in free agency were graded higher by pro football focus in the NFL. Um, so then on trades, B minus, it appears that polls misjudged the market for Justin Fields and then could have had a better compensation, but didn't take it in order to let Fields go somewhere on his desired team list, according to an ESPN report. Uh, it polls never said a thing about fields before free agency right up to the draft. It's difficult to see how they could have fielded better, couldn't have fielded better offers. What poll did by immediately saying he wanted to do right by fields was put himself at a disadvantage in talks with other GMs. They knew he was desperate uh, to deal away the quarterback. Uh, a veteran GM like, say, the Eagles' Howie Roserman wouldn't have made a mistake like that. Chalk this up to inexperience. At the opposite end of the spectrum were the trades for both Ryan Bates and Keenan Allen. Do I? By the way, we do have to note here just one thing here. Um, this argument that they're making is basically that players are nothing more than capital for the team. Uh, and he's being graded by not doing right by Justin Fields, but by making sure that he maximized uh, the amount that he could snag from another team for Justin Fields. And you can feel one way or another about it, but it's a very weird sort of dichotomy here where on one hand you have uh, this person who's honoring the spirit of whatever the agreement is between him and the player and not stabbing that player in the back and stabbing that player in the back and getting himself the best possible deal. It's very wild how they kind of rate these things and look at them in this context. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but you know what? that's sports illustrated for you. So there we are. Bates is a guard center. Uh, and, and at the opposite of the spectrum were the trades for Ryan Bates and Keenan Allen. Bates is a guard center. They had highly graded dating back two years and tried to get then to acquire a player who can be a challenger to Shelton as a starter or a backup at guard, or even a starter at guard is always a plus. They give up only a fifth round pick for Bates. So far in two polls draft, they've only pulled in one starter from the fifth round or later. So a fifth rounder is little to give for a valuable player who's making less than $4.5 million a year. The Allen trade is even better. Acquiring a player of Pro Bowl status, healthy but 32 years old, for a fourth round pick isn't a steal. However, it is the kind of move they can benefit from even if he only has one year left on his contract. This one year could allow him to help mentor a drafted receiver while he contributes as a valuable target for their rookie quarterback. And there's nothing saying it is it has to be for only one year either, uh, as they have the cap space for an extension. And then overall, uh, they give him a grade of a B minus. You like to think that they would have a uh, have added more star power rather than just depth at some of the abundance of salary cap cash. And I think a lot of us are probably feeling kind of the same way that that maybe you know there there could have been uh, it it. it, uh, it uh, Mitchell Kinsey says, whoever thought back-to-back -back unskippable ads on YouTube was a good idea should be fired. Guy, Mitchell, I will tell you this. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know that that's uh, – and 88 Buckmeister says, yes, it is. It's true. Uh, he's going to be number 18, and Jalen Johnson's going to be number one. Uh, but, Mitchell, so um, I don't know what happened. Uh, when I watch a show now on, on YouTube, and I spend most of my time on YouTube – it used to be that you had five seconds, maybe 10 or 15 seconds to watch an ad and, you know, that was it. And then, you know, you could, you could skip past it after five seconds or something like that. You just go through a couple of ads or something. And every once in a while you get a 15 second ad. Well, now some of these shows have like 30 second ads that you have to sit through in order to get in. I'm not really sure what the logic here or the reason. I mean, I'm sure it's revenue uh, generated because, you know, to be fair here, YouTube doesn't pay a ton when it comes to like ad revenue, they tell you that it's a ton until you actually do the math on it. And then it gets a little bit weird. So, but yeah, um, um, <laughs> it is, it is kind of wild that you have to sit through a lot of ads, but you know what? It's still better than TV. I think the biggest flaw of what polls did during free agency is he left too much on the shoulders of Pickens and Dexter to produce immediately this year at defensive tackle and too big of a need at right defensive end for someone who can come in and deliver sacks from day one. I disagree with that just a little bit. It is wild that Pickens and, and Gervon Dexter are the, the guys at this point, but uh, you know we haven't seen what the draft has yielded, right? We don't know uh, what they're going to do. And we're relying on some young talent. But here's the thing. 
Uh, this is somebody from the outside looking in who doesn't know the character of these guys that's just kind of making an assumption based on you know, the pieces that they see being moved around. It could be that the Bears feel really confident at Gervon Dexter, which is why they're not as concerned as we out here in the field, if you will, are. They, they think that he's obviously going to be something and that he's going to have a big move from first year to second year. And you know what? This could be the, the case. This could be that these guys end up being a lot better than what we think. And, and look, this is Ryan Poles really trying to, uh, if you will, say that he thinks that he's done a fair job in these drafts so far. Tyreek Stevenson, starter. Kervon Dexter, starter. I mean, he's bringing in people. Darnell Wright, starter. He's bringing in these young guys who should have big upsides in their second year, in their leap from their first to their second year. They should have enormous upside, and they should get better. And these three positions are going to be improved. So if that does work, then... Uh, we're pretty good. And by the way, I'm going to show you something in just a few minutes that might make you feel a little bit better. Probably what if you don't like Demarcus Walker, and I'm not a fan, by the way, Mark of Demarcus Walker, but I am always looking for reasons to like any player that's that's on Chicago, right? And Demarcus Walker at this point is our guy at the defensive end position. But if you look at the thing, like what I keep telling you guys, last six games of the season, the Bears were the number one defense overall in scoring, certainly ended the season as the number one rushing defense. And all those pieces are still kind of in place. The exception here is Kevin Byard, really, and the loss of Justin Jones, which I think Irvon Dexter is a worthy replacement in that context. There's not much of a drop-off there, if any drop-off at all. So I think that the Bears are a better team defensively, and maybe there's going to be some consistency in having played next to each each and every one of these guys, you know, just kind of popping in Gravon Dexter. Maybe that makes the team better. And Demarcus Walker, maybe him getting a little bit more playing time over Yannick Ngakwe makes the team better. Perhaps, right? So that being said, we're, we're going to look at the last six games of the season, and you're going to see that actually DeMarcus Walker performed pretty well. We're going to check that out uh, in just a little bit. So uh, it, it ended up being uh, a pretty decent, I think, at least in my estimation, um, move. But again, B minus for Ryan Poles. And uh, finally, before we get into Twitter, uh, heard it on the X, if you will. Uh, we've got uh, the Bears are now hosting uh, a bunch of local prospects, and this was a big deal. Um, uh, I think that there were a couple people that actually uh, showed out uh, a bit. And you know what? Th these are a few of the names that you might even be familiar with. Uh, so last summer uh, the in Buffalo Grove, uh, Maima uh, Jung Meda, a, a linebacker at Wisconsin, attended a Bears uh, training camp as a fan. On Tuesday, uh, he ended up being here with 40 other NFL prospects participating in the Bears local pro day in advance of the draft. I was here this past summer with my friends to watch. Uh, it was really fun, but coming back and being on the other side of it is even better. Uh, and it should be added that Jung Meda uh, played three seasons at Wisconsin with Sanborn, trains with Edwards in Milwaukee, and draws inspiration from other former Badgers. Sanborn was such a consistent player at Wisconsin at the next level. He's done the same thing. And TJ was a guy who was doubted on draft day, had to fight every single day to prove he was as good as he actually was. And I see a lot of myself in that story. Uh, also, D'Angelo Hardy showed up. Uh, and he is a North Central College receiver. Uh, so, you know, there's going to be some people when we when we start this 100-man roster, we're actually going to have a, a lot of local talent around here that's uh, going to be, you know, part of this. So Hardy's favorite were Devin Hester, Brian Erlocker, Matt Forte, and Jay Cutler. Jay Cutler, as one of the favorites, guys, let me get a shout-out for Jay Cutler. Smoking Jay in the house. That's awesome. This was a great opportunity to get in front of a team and really want to play for the future, show them my skills, show them everything I know about football. Minnesota receiver Corey Crooms, uh, who was also a huge Bears fan and uh, grew up in Country Club Hills. Uh, he was there yesterday. Uh, and uh, it's no coincidence that there are several local prospects on the Bears roster, uh, like TJ Edwards, Jack Sanborn, and Cole Komet. Uh, last year, Ryan, uh, General Manager Ryan Poles told reporters that he likes to sign Chicago area players because they're often more motivated to perform at a high level 
due to their ties to the Bears and the city. And let me remind you one more time, if there's any of you out here that are Green Bay Packers fans, uh, I just wanted to say one thing to you. And I'm not doing this. because This is Mr. Rogers, by the way. Mr. Rogers says number one. You're number one, right? Um, Montez Sweat says he is not losing to the Green Bay Packers again this year. So uh, you've been told, you've been warned, uh, you better, uh, you know, pack a lunch because the Bears are coming for the Packers this year. Ah, who knows what's going to happen. But Montez Sweat feeling pretty good about his position. Anyway, moving on, there are quite a few players that we'll probably see uh, on the 40-man roster. Remember, if you haven't, uh, go consider uh, going to the Bears, you know, they do have that, uh, they, they do have like one practice that's an open practice inside Soldier Field. Go sign up. It's a family, it's a family event. It's a family fest. Uh, and you get to see the team uh, at practice and 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 do a lot of stuff. So it's very cool uh, to go out there and do that kind of stuff. And now these are the 2024 opponents. Let's talk about this real quick. We don't know the, the one thing that we do know is that the Bears will not be playing the Green Bay Packers first this season. And three of the last six seasons, the Bears have played the Green Bay Packers and lost each and every one of those, starting off at least the last three seasons, three, three of the last six seasons, 0-1 to Green Bay. Not having a lot of success against Green Bay, by the way. But Green Bay, I think it's going to be in like Brazil or something like that. Uh, and then the Bears are going to open their season, um, the preseason, by the way, in... Uh, at the Hall of Fame game. So uh, that'll be an interesting move there. But uh, I think the important part is, you know, let's look at who we've got. At home, we've got the Rams. We've got the Tennessee Titans. Um, we've got Carolina. We've got New England. And guys, I want you to look at, you know, home and away. Let's just consider we should win both games against the, uh, against the Vikings and the Lions. Let's just consider that for a second. I'm not trying to take it for granted, but I'm saying that, we match up very well against both of these teams and have been and, and have been playing them very well for the last little while, right? So this should be the year where there's a breakout. So let's consider that should be an easy four wins. Now, in our home games, you're going to have New England, you're going to have Carolina. Um, it should be easy wins. I mean, it should be. You never know what's going to happen. Seattle is in full rebuild mode, probably. Uh, that gives us, uh, just consider for a second here, we're talking about seven or so wins uh, with this uh, with this situation. We're talking about uh, Detroit and Minnesota, uh, four wins. We're talking about Seattle, Carolina, New England. That should be seven wins right there. Now throw in Jacksonville and Tennessee, Um can we beat them at home? I think so. That's nine wins right there. That's nine wins. So now where do we come up with 10 or 11 wins? And that um, the Texans, Washington Commanders, Arizona Cardinals. So take a moment and look at what this looks like. Um, you know, wh who are we going to lose to, right? L who, who are the losses? Well, uh, if we say that we're not going to lose to Green Bay, that's not necessarily true, right? However, uh, the Rams uh, probably going to be Rams are going to be a tough out. Uh, San Francisco is going to be a tough out. So you're looking at a 15 and two team just based on that context right there. So now it's where it get it, it where it gets interesting is um, how can we overcome the Houston Texans? Now the Texans, by the way, C.J. Stroud um, is that a one year wonder? You know, ask that question. Um, Will the Bears be improved in their in the passing game enough that you know some of that scoring issues that we had are not there anymore? Um, is the defense going to respond in a positive way to this? And guys, when I told you that I think that the Bears are going to win at least eleven games and be a playoff contender, and and I, and I keep trying to push this narrative to you that this is the, this is going to be a good team. It also comes down to this this um, uh, this schedule, right? I mean, and you just say, look, maybe Montez Sweat's lying. We lose two games to Green Bay. That's 15 and two. Uh, we lose to the LA Rams. That's 14 and three. Uh, we lose to San Francisco. That's 13 and four. This is a 13 and four potentially team that would still end up running the table against everybody else 
and be in the playoffs and probably win the division based upon that. So um, could that be what happens? I don't think so. I mean, there's going to be some slip ups along the way. Uh, Caleb Williams is a rookie. He's going to have rookie mistakes. He's going to have moments where uh, we're going to be like, damn it, wish he would have done something different. You know, there's going to be these moments that 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 happens with. But, you know, the overall and the overarching thing here is this is a very soft schedule. It's a very soft schedule. Uh, the question really is how well and how good are Tennessee and Jacksonville going to be? Because, you know, I would say Seattle, New England, and Carolina are, you know, they're not, nothing's guaranteed in the NFL, but we should be able to play pretty well against those three. And then, you know, we've got our, our division rivals who we've played very well and we should be even better because they're not better. They're not, they're not better. And even if Detroit's a little bit better, we've had theirs. Um, we've had theirs, um, uh, we've had their number. So, um, and, and last year's was too. look how that turned out. Yeah. But that was, I mean, so it, it is fair to point out here. Um, the question at this point is, did Matt Eberflus learn his lesson about not being ready for the season? Did he learn that lesson? If he learned that lesson, we're going to be fine. Uh, and, and, and if the bears are prepared for success, the team still plays for him, you know? Uh, there, there are a lot of different pieces in place here that are, and by the way, it, you know, we do have to say that both Luke Getze and Justin Fields are accountable for the lack of production. It's not just Luke Getze. It's not just Justin Fields. Uh, they underperformed dramatically. Um, they, they've underproduced dramatically. Uh, and, and look, I mean, go back and, and look at, at some of these games, you know, we gave up 31 points to Denver and we lost by three points, but we should have scored one more touchdown or we should have stopped them one time. If, if that happens, if we're better and that happens, the game changes, uh, with the 16 to 13 lost again, uh, against Minnesota. You know, if Justin Fields doesn't go down, does that change the dynamic of it? Do we end up winning that game? You know, there are, and by the way, probably not, but um, if we play a little bit better, complete a few more passes, uh, do, do, you know, attend to what Justin Fields' strengths were, you know, we can go back and we can relitigate this all over again and again and again. If we don't give up 17 points to uh, Denver or Detroit in four minutes, then, you know, these things change. The, these things are different. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of different pieces that went wrong and awry on a team that was still building. And now what we're looking at is a team that's better. So what I would say is uh, the argument would be, well, you know, this team was not ready to compete. We felt like it was ready to compete, uh, but it was not. It was clearly not ready to compete. Montez Sweat coming in changed the dynamic of the team completely and tremendously. We ended up being the number one rushing defense after the fact. and we finally started to get after the quarterback and you might not you might still not know that but we actually did when you start to look at the statistics of what we were doing and then let's move on here uh and let's get into the next piece here where we heard it on the x and what we're looking at right here is you are looking at a a sky cam right here of Caleb Williams echo avoidance of Caleb Williams so we're going to watch this real quick and you're going to see Caleb Williams right here uh, coming for. Look at what he misses. So uh, the ball gets snapped. Uh, he's getting himself ready. And this is against Oregon. So right here. So we've got a backside. Uh, we've got him coming in on the front side. And look at this. He steps up into the pocket. He maneuvers. He avoids every one of these guys. There's four rushers uh, coming at him. And here we go. Boom. That's the kind of avoidance that we're looking for. He doesn't, and, and look, here's the important part. The important part is, does he keep his eyes down the field? Does he keep his eyes down the field? Look at this, down the field, eyes down the field. He's recognizing receivers. Let's let's move that up a little bit here. Uh, so there we go. And here we go. He's, a, he's avoiding the rush. And guess what? Still downfield. He's looking at this receiver right here. Uh, so now, check it out one more time. So he gets the breakout, and the ball snapped. He's watching his receivers over here. He switches to these receivers over here while he's avoiding it. Now, he's looking downfield still, got his ball still ready to throw the ball at any moment. Nobody's open. They become rushers. 
and this is what he does. So um, there we go. Uh, look, guys, we're going to have to give this guy a chance. Um, uh, they're gonna, I'm pretty sure we're going to start Caleb Williams out of the gate. It would be, it would kind of be wild if we started uh, Bajan, um because, again, we still have the question. Now, we did see something yesterday showing a little bit more arm strength for, for Tyson Bajan. But, you know, I feel like we're just going to throw him into the fire and we're going to learn a real quick lesson about Caleb Williams. I don't think we're going to uh, I don't think we're going to wait on this one. Uh, and the, the situation is, even if I disagree, the Bears think that this guy is a uh, talent. They think that he is a generational type talent. Again, I disagree. I think that's Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, but I mean, you know, th the guy is doing a fantastic job over and over again. I mean, look at this, avoiding the rush, keeping his eyes downfield. Uh, he does avoid these guys. And then boom, still looking downfield, still looking to make the play. That's the kind of stuff that we're wanting. And then he doesn't go for the touchdown. He doesn't get himself injured. He slides in and moves on to the next play. That's what you're looking for. That's the way you want this guy uh, to perform. And look, here's another play right here. Uh, same thing. Like the they're they're coming at him. They got six people coming. And look at this. He avoids. This is six people, by the way. Uh, look at this. One, two, three, four, five. I'm oh, sorry, it's five. Uh, and then one um, one spy. So and and he makes the play. By the way, like again, go back here and look at this. This is him taking the snap, and then boom. Uh, we got one, two, three, four, five. We got five rushers coming at him. And what does he do? It just goes right around them all. Goes right around them all. And then, uh, boom, makes the throw across where wide open, finds the wide open guy. Does Justin Fields do that? I mean, that was the question. And, and I don't think that he does. I don't think that he did. I don't think that he was comfortable in the pocket in the way that, that Caleb Williams is, even in the face of this kind of rush. So I really think that we're probably going to see something, um, I think we're going to like what we see from Caleb Williams. I don't, I don't know that we're going to love it, but I, I think that he does not look bad in any way. I mean, there's, you know, there's moments, there's moments where we have problems. I mean, and, and the guy is a rookie, so there's going to be mistakes, but this is not a horrible, horrible situation. Now also saw Ben Devine from Chicago NFL do his uh, mock draft. And he took, by the way, some very familiar names. We took Caleb Williams, Roma Dunsey. And look, by the way, uh, Caleb Williams and Roma Dunsey at the number one and number nine seem to be the pairing that everybody is, you know, not demanding necessarily, but looking at. Uh, and then Braden Fisk. Hey, where'd you see Braden Fisk before? Uh, that's right. I draft him every goddamn draft I can because uh, I think he's going to be a supremely talented defensive tackle out of Florida State when he's available in the right position. And then Brandon Coleman, uh, which, by the way, I took Brandon Coleman again in my draft today uh, because I had that option between him and Mason McCormick, and I took Brandon Coleman uh, in, in in my draft today. So, yeah, uh, and then over here, uh, this is Demarcus Walker, by the way. Um, and and I, I told you guys um, that, you know, Demarcus Walker, actually, when you start to look at it, uh, I mean, I guess he kind of came together. This is him uh, at the beginning there we go. Uh, that's the one sack that we had against Jordan Love. Um, <laughs> there it was right there uh, with Chicago up three to nothing in the first quarter of that final game. And look at that. He was pushing him out of the way. And here we go. Demarcus Walker is in for a big year two for the Bears. 23 stats, 30 TOT, um, and then three and a half sacks, and then 16 quarterback hits. Uh, he was fired down the stretch with two sacks and eight quarterback hits in the last four games. That's what we're looking for. Uh, again, this is the last four games, not the last six games, but eight quarterback hits in the last four games means that Demarcus Walker was applying pressure uh, in a way that we had not seen from Demarcus Walker up to this point. So now the question is, is he going to continue? And is that why the Bears are comfortable? Um, uh, is that why they're comfortable with Demarcus Walker in that position? Uh, did we stumble across somebody who's on that upside move? Uh, is, is that what we're looking at right now? So if that is the case, then I think that we have the makings of a fantastic team, guys. Like, you know, it, it has to be said here, you know, I might be me. 
I might be selling Demarcus Walker short. And when I do that, I do that saying that he was one of the linchpins on the number one rushing defense. You know, it's not his, it, it's not all of his ability that's in question. It's just his ability to get to the quarterback. And guess what? Montez Sweat is giving him an opportunity to get to the quarterback. And in fact, if you kind of uh, go back and watch what happened here, then you can see here why this is possible because of Montez Sweat right here. Right there, you see there's two blockers on Montez Sweat on this side, leaving everybody else one-on-one, and then boom, he makes the play. And by the way, that big-ass monster right there, um, that's Gervon Dexter pushing his way into that lineup as well. So, you know, there's a there's a lot to like about um, these guys in these positions. Like, I, 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 you know, the more I watch, the more I see, the more I enjoy and look at and say, you know, we might be in for something special. So, uh, but let's move on and let's get to the final piece here for the day. Uh, the defensive roster still looks the same. Uh, by the way, rest in peace, OJ Simpson. Uh, OJ Simpson is now, uh, has now passed away. So uh, the juice is now loose in heaven. And uh, I don't know that he's going there, but you know what I mean? Uh, rest in peace, OJ, or burn in hell, depending on how you felt about that lawsuit. Um, so anyway, Gervon Dexter, Demarcus Walker, those are the questions, but, um, you know, I think that's, you know, um, uh, I, I think that, I think we've really got <laughs> the roster. Uh, it's the, the offensive roster here. Uh, you know, what do we do about Braxton Jones or do we just kind of hold on to Braxton Jones? Is this another one of those situations where, you know, Braxton Jones is just, you know, he's going to come into his own this month this is going to be the time where it, where, it, where it really starts to gel for him. Uh, and he's still third-year player, so um, you know I, I think he's still going to be better. And then you have Ryan Bates or Coleman Shelton, one or the other. Look, I just think that we were upgraded. This is, an up, this is a tremendous upgrade in this team. Um, Keenan Allen, Gerald Everett. Like, I, guys, I really, the more I talk myself into this, and that's what I'm doing, by the way. I'm talking myself into this lineup right here. Uh, and the more I look at it, the more I feel like, wow, like this really could be something special. Now, the chance that we're taking is DeAndre Swift. Is he as good as uh, he was last year? Can he maintain that level? And if he can, oh man, we're going to be awesome. Uh, however, the question is, can he do that? And if he cannot do that, then here's the best part about it. It, it doesn't matter because Roshan Johnson and Khalil Herbert, they can do that stuff. We've seen them do it. We already know that they're capable of doing it. So we're in a fantastic position right now uh, with this team. This team is going to be a lot better than what we saw last year. This is going to be an upgraded team. So um, that's what it looks like. I mean, again, pretty much a lock. And by the way, uh, Patriot Watch came in yesterday and he made a, a statement here, which the statement was about from about six days ago. Uh, and he said that, you know, the Bears could sign Caleb Williams at any point because they're not, you know, obligated. Um, uh, uh, they're not obligated. And, and by the way, um, I highly doubt it. Philly's O-line was top in the league and opened up massive gaps for him. Well, guess what? The number one rushing defense or the number one rushing offense was the Chicago Bears. Some of that was Caleb, was was Justin Fields, but not all of that was Justin Fields. Remember, Roshan Johnson averaged 4.6 yards a carry, and so did Khalil Herbert averaging 4.3. And Deonta Foreman, I think, was like 3.9. It was not great, but it's not bad. You know, um, I, I think that the Chicago Bears are going to be a better rushing team uh, by virtue of not having that, you know, uh, by consolidating, if you will. I don't think that we're going to see – We'll see maybe 200 yards rushing from Caleb Williams if if we get that. But we will see um, DeAndre Swift will get line blocking. Um, and, I mean, again, you have to consider when you come down to these. Um, let's see. Uh, there we go. Uh, one second here. All right, there we go. Yeah. So here it is right here. So this is, uh, this is what we, this is what we did now take out, take, take, we had 2,399 rushing yards last year. Uh, take out, um, let's go, let's do this yards per carry. 
Uh, the Ravens had 4.9. Of course, Lamar Jackson just goes ham every time. Um, he's an anomaly. But we averaged 4.5 yards per rush. The 49ers, 4.8. The Cardinals, 5. The Dolphins, 5. Philadelphia, 4.3. So we were in, they have, they had 2,190 yards. We had 2,399. So I think by by, prox, by process here, um, I think that the Bears are a better rushing team this year than they were last year. Like, like we really, I think, did a pretty good job. And here's the place. Here's the place where it matters, right? The Eagles only had one rush for over 40 yards. Probably going to be uh, uh, DeAndre Swift. The Bears had no rushes for over 40 yards. Now, just consider this for a second. Just consider for a second here. The Bears averaged 4.5 yards per carry with zero 40-yard uh, runs. None. Uh, the other teams had multiples, right? Um, so imagine how strong of an offensive line we actually have when it comes down to it. Like we're 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 not bad at this offensive line game. So I I, I think that it gets better. I think that you know this team ends up being a little bit better uh, than what we've seen so far. So uh, let's get back to it though, and let's get into the draft. So here's what I did today. Uh, I took Caleb Williams at number one, and then uh, I traded down a bunch of times. Um, I traded down from the nine to the thirteen. Then I traded the thirteen to the twenty one. And that's how I picked up everything that I picked up. So what I did was I took Caleb Williams. This is showing you what could happen here. And again, I took Brandon Coleman, just like Ben Devine did. Uh, Caleb Williams was number one. Number 21, I was able to get Jackson Powers Johnson. However, I do want to say that it's starting to get weird because as we get closer to uh, the draft, Zach Barton or Graham Barton, the offensive center, at um at duke is starting to move up and they're starting to put him above jackson powers johnson in a lot of these drafts the reason for that is um i, I want to say that jackson powers johnson is six foot uh six foot one uh 316 pounds graham barton is six foot five 316 so uh it, it is possible that graham barton is going to be available at that level too. And that is a six foot five monster. Uh, is he as good as Jackson Powers Johnson? That really is the question. A lot of people looking at this, changing their minds late in the season about Graham Barton. So uh, I don't know yet, uh, but he's out there. Next up at number 57, uh, which I picked up by this trade was Michael Hall. Uh, Michael Hall Jr., defensive tackle out of Ohio State. That way we got at least one MHJ. And then at number 76, I took uh, I took uh, Roman Wilson, um, wide receiver out of Michigan. Look, you want somebody who wins championships. Roman Wilson uh, was the best receiver for Michigan. So uh, let's go with that at that 76. Now I dropped that 75 down one uh, and picked up a, a, like a Miami third round pick or something like that. Uh, and then at number 92, Kieran Amagaji, uh, offensive tackle out of Yale, and then Brandon Coleman, offensive guard out of TCU. And in these trades, I got a Miami second round pick and a Miami third round pick. Uh, you know, this is, that's how it played out. So uh, I think in this context, we probably got three people who are worthy of starting, even though Roman Wilson will probably end up start, would in this context would probably end up starting Um part of part of the way through the season. I think they're going to give Tyler Scott the opportunity. So uh, he won't be a starter to, to lead it off, but you know, this one you've got uh, a, certainly an upgraded lineup. Now I, the problem with this is I don't think that they're going to be looking at Jackson powers Johnson. I don't think that there's any kind of opportunity. I really think that the bears are most likely uh, going to uh, just go with what they have uh, or, or at least that's the way it feels right now. Because and, and by the way, that doesn't mean that they will. It just seems like um, it, it just seems like the context right now is to just take what's available when it's available uh, at these spots. And, it, you know, it's starting to look like they're wanting to pair two guys up to give them like four years to, to work together, if you will. Uh, so, you know, we draft Caleb Williams. And then with the number nine, it, it looks like they're looking for. Uh, a wide receiver. Now, if we get to this spot and there's no wide receiver available, what do you do then? Brian Thomas at number 20. Uh, I don't think that that makes any sense. Olu Fashanu, offensive tackle. Um, Latu, 
So, you know, it, to me, it would be Jared Verse, but I mean, whoever. And then, um, and, and yeah, that's, see, I don't understand. I don't even understand how people are saying, like this, by the way, that's fantasy booking. And it's, I mean, it is what we're doing most of the time, right? Fantasy booking, but it doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't see any way um, that, that we end up in a situation in which we can get, um, we can get Marvin Harrison Jr. <clears throat> it would be cool. But I just don't see any way. Uh, and then over here, we're going to take a center and Cedric Van Pran. And then we got the number 122. And this is what I think they're going to end up doing. I don't know if they're going to take Van Pran or anything like that. Uh, but then, um, you know, who do you take at this point? Um, I don't know how they grade them out, by the way, uh, when they're looking. And, and I'm sure that they're looking longer term um, for, for some of this. And so I'm going to say we're going to end up with somebody like Mason McCormick or something like that. So uh, the picks end up being Caleb Williams, Jared Verse, uh, Cedric Van Pran, and then uh, Mason McCormick, something like that. Like, I think it's going to be pretty simple. Uh, 75 is an opportunity to get Roman Wilson uh, if you need a, a wide receiver sometimes in this draft. So you know, there is some opportunities there. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I don't think that we're going to do as much I don't think that we're, I, I think that they're kind of uh, stuck at just picking up these pieces, you know, as they do uh, and not doing something that I'm doing here, which is doing a lot of trading and finding those good positions. So that's what it looks like to me. Uh, and let me know what it looks like to you. I mean, leave a comment down below. Uh, let me know. Uh, but it is time for me to get off here uh, and get to uh, the day, if you will. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, that you take the time to come hang out with me uh, does not fall on deaf ears. So make sure you hit the like button on the way out. Helps push me up in the algorithm. And we will talk to you again very soon. I will see you guys tomorrow.